So let's start with this. What is the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy relationship? As a professional counselor, I like to think of a healthy relationship to be one that's defined by giving, whereas an unhealthy relationship tends to be defined by taking. Healthy relationships tend to fill you up, whereas unhealthy relationships tend to drain you. You know, we all have that good friend where when we go out with them for coffee or grab lunch, we walk away from that interaction feeling a little bit more full. But we also have that other friend who when we go out with them for lunch or coffee, we walk away from that interaction feeling kind of drained. Can you think of somebody like that? If you can't, maybe they're thinking of you, so be careful. You might be that draining person. But, but that's the idea, you know, healthy relationships fill us up and they can't fill us up to overflowing, even though we think they can. They can fill us up, they can add drops of water to our bucket, but they can't actually fill us up to the point of being healthy. One way I like to think about this is using the cup analogy. Imagine with me two cups. Each one of them is just half full. Most of the time when we go into relationships, we're actually half full emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically. And we're thinking, that relationship, when I find that person, it's gonna, I'm going to get filled up. That's what I'm missing. You know, I need, to, I need that person to help fill me up. And so you get two half full people and you pour them together and then what do you have? A full cup. And for a while it feels good. And you start feeling fulfilled. But then, after the honeymoon stage is over, for some people, within a matter of minutes, you realize what you actually have is still two half full people who are just desperately trying to use the other person to fill themselves up. But it doesn't work. One of my favorite passages in scripture about the idea of feeling full and something we sang about this morning of understanding Christ's love is found in Ephesians 3, verse 18 and 19. I'm gonna read it to you. It says this, I pray that you and all God's holy people will have the power to understand the greatness of Christ's love. How wide, how long, how high, how deep that love is. Christ's love is greater than anyone could ever know. But I pray that you would be able to know that love, listen to this part, so that you can be filled with everything God has for you. Then you can be filled. Once you grasp Christ's love, what an awesome picture there when we understand that fullness comes from understanding God's love for us. Think of it this way. When we grasp God's love, his overflowing love for us, it fills our cup. And it doesn't just fill it. It fills it to the point of overflowing. Now imagine with me two people, both of them overflowing that's what a healthy relationship is all about, when we can learn to love out of our overflow, not, about, not out of our need. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today because maybe you're sitting here and you're feeling half full. Or maybe you're sitting here and you think, why is it that I always attract people who are half full? You know, what is going on here? What, why, why am I always stuck in these seemingly unhealthy relationships? So one thing I I want you to realize today is this. Human beings are magnetic. Whether you realize it or not, you are magnetic. They did this social study where they took a bunch of people and they put them in these strange scuba suits where all you could see was their face. You couldn't really see their body. You couldn't see much of their physical features. You could just see their face. And they put them all in a room together. And they kind of basically put cameras on them to see what they would do. And after a few hours of interaction, they realized something. The people who had similar features, similar physical features, tended to start clumping together and socializing. So at the end of the experiment, you had these groups of people who actually looked similar. And this study affirmed the research that Human beings are magnetic, and we attract people who are like us physically. Now, if we attract people who are similar to us in physical features, how much more magnetic are we when it comes to our spiritual life, when it comes to our emotional life? Healthy people attract other healthy people. That's the bottom line. And as a professional counselor, a lot of people come to me and say, Deborah, 
you know, why am I always stuck in these toxic relationships? One toxic relationship after another. Why do I always attract the jerks? Why do I always attract the people who aren't really interested in me? And as hard as it is, I have to tell them, it's important to take a few steps back and ask yourself, how healthy are you? Because you are attracting people on your personal level of health. And that might be hard to hear, but if we could grasp that, I really believe it would change our relationships. So how do you become a healthy person? What does it even mean to be a healthy person? If you're taking notes, this is the time to write some things down. We're going to talk about three things that healthy people have going on for them. Number one, healthy people deal with their past. Number two, healthy people know their identity in the present. And number three, healthy people have a vision for their future. Let's start with our past. Do we really all have baggage that we need to deal with? I mean, really, I'm at a Christian college here. Do we really all have baggage? <laughs> You're not in your head, yes, I like that, because it's so true, you know? I think, I think sometimes, especially in the Christian culture, we can talk about our sins, maybe an area we need to have accountability in, but we don't want to talk about baggage, right? No one wants to have baggage. It can feel like such a heavy thing. But the truth is we all have a past. We all have some sort of a story that we're coming from. And for most of us, that involves what we call in psychology our family of origin. Family of origin is basically how you grew up. Who raised you? Because those early years were such formative years in helping you to develop everything you know about love and relationships. Where do you first learn about love? By how love was communicated to you in your family of origin. In fact, research even shows that watching our parents interact influences how we act in our present relationships watching how they loved each other, how they took responsibility in arguments, how they resolved conflict or didn't resolve conflict. And all of these things add up to how we learn about love and how we in turn give love to other people. And sometimes we don't even realize that we are living out things from our past. We're, we're so used to them that we don't even connect that they come from our family of origin. There's a really funny story about a young woman, a newlywed, who wanted to make a ham for her husband on Easter. So she gets out the old recipe from her mom, and she's reading through it, and it says, cut off the ends of the ham. So she cuts off the ends of the ham, and her husband walks in, and he's like, what are you doing, honey? She's like, oh, I'm just making you an Easter ham. I'm following the recipe. And he's like, yeah, but why are you cutting off the ends of the ham? And she said, I don't know. It's my mom's recipe. I'll ask my mom. So the next day she sees her mom and she says, Mom, what's up with this recipe? Why are we cutting off the ends of the ham? And her mom says, good question. I don't know. Ask your grandma. It's her recipe. So she goes and asks her grandma, Grandma, why is it that I'm cutting off the ends of the ham in the recipe? And her grandma says, oh, honey, that's just because my pan was too small. I had to cut off the ends of the ham. And here we are years later still cutting off the ends of the ham. And it's kind of a funny story, but guys, how often do we do this in our real life? You know, we're kind of on autopilot. We just do the things we've seen. We do the things we've learned, sometimes without even questioning whether or not we're healthy. We just think, this is who I am. But the truth is, we all are going to have moments where we stop and think, oh my gosh, I'm exactly like my mom right now. Or, oh my goodness, I'm exactly like my dad right now. And sometimes that's the good thing, but sometimes it's really not a good thing. And sometimes when we look at our life, we see that we are carrying sins, that we are carrying bad habits, that we don't know how to deal with conflict, that we don't have healthy communication, that we don't know how to express our emotions. And you look and you see all this baggage that we then carry with us into the context of marriage. And guys, how many of you in here are married? Raise your hand. Any married person will tell you that marriage is like a pressure cooker. And whatever you bring in there is multiplied times 100. The good, the bad, and the ugly. 
So the best thing we can do for our relationships, whether you're single or married, is to deal with your own personal sins and struggles while standing alone. And maybe you're in here today and you're single and you're thinking, what does it matter? I'm not in a pressure cooker. I'm not even married yet. Statistics tell us that there's a good chance you will be married at some point in your life. And guess what, singles? You are 50% of a future marriage. Whether or not you're in it now, you're 50% of the equation. And if you can get your half healthy right now, that's like going to premarital counseling without even having a spouse because you can start doing the work right now while you're single and dealing with those things in your life that you need to deal with. So healthy people deal with their past. The second thing is healthy people know who they are in the present. They embrace their identity in Christ. There's a psychologist by the name of John Locke. And he's one of the founding fathers of psychology. And he came up with this theory called the tabula rasa theory. In Latin, that means the blank slate theory. Imagine with me a big blank slate. Kind of is one right behind me. Imagine now that you're born into life with nothing on this slate. This is your slate of identity, according to John Locke. And he says, when you're born, you don't know who you are. You have zero identity. But as you go through life, the things that people say about you, they start adding words on your board. And that begins shaping your identity. And I think of my three children and all the things that I'm pouring into their life every day, the things I'm saying about them, the positive, encouraging words I want them to believe. But then I also think of so many of us in this room today who have had things said about them that maybe were not so good. Maybe they were downright ugly. Maybe they were lies. And you end up carrying these labels for so long that sometimes you start believing them. And not only that, you start living out of those labels, whether or not they are true. Because you'll always attract the kind of person you believe you deserve. So then it ends up affecting your relationships as well. But the beautiful thing about our relationship with Christ is that he comes to wipe away those labels and start us from scratch. He doesn't just come to write in nice words around the ugly words, you know, oh, you're so sweet, you're so kind, you're so loving. He comes to completely obliterate the past and start writing new things on our labels. And I remember when I went through my own personal identity crisis, I was actually probably about most of your age here. I was a college student, and I just went through a pretty intense breakup with a guy that I was dating. We'd been dating for a year and a half, and all of a sudden I just, you know, little by little knew that he wasn't the right fit for my life. But I didn't know that in the beginning because I didn't actually know who I was. I was having sort of an identity crisis, and if you don't know who you are, you're not going to know the person that fits into your life. And so when we broke up, I realized I had sort of lost myself. Because how many of you know you can spend so much time trying to find the person that you're going to marry and trying to get to know them that you end up losing yourself? And so here I was having to kind of figure out who I was. And God's word was such a huge part of that relearning of my identity and understanding my identity in Christ. And there are some scriptures that I want to go through with you today that really helped speak into my identity in Christ. Number one, you have a purpose. First Peter 2 9 says this, you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for a high calling. You might be in here today wondering what your purpose is. You're taking classes. You're trying to figure out, do you even have a purpose? God's word reminds you that you do, no matter how you're feeling right now. Number two, you are accepted. Later that verse goes on to say, you are to tell others of the difference he made for you from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. No matter how many Facebook friends you have or how many likes you get on your posts, you're accepted. You don't need the approval of your peers or your professors or your parents to know that you are accepted by Christ. 
Number three, you are noticed. Psalm 139, you have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. They say one of the biggest fears of man is the fear of being invisible. But in this scripture, we are reminded that we are noticed by Almighty God in everyday activities, every little thing we do. You are forgiven, Colossians 2.14. He has taken away your sin and nailed it to the cross. And lastly, you are loved. 1 John 3.1, what great love the Father has lavished on us. And I love that verse especially because we talked about earlier understanding Christ's love in order for us to be filled. There's a verse that we all know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But so often in Christian culture, we focus on the love your neighbor part and we don't even touch the love yourself part. In fact, I had a guy email me once after I wrote an article. He was kind of angry and he said, it's kind of selfish to talk about loving yourself. Because we have this wrong perception that somehow loving ourselves is wrong. But in order to love others in a healthy way, according to God's word, loving others is contingent on our ability to love ourselves. And you can't really love yourself until you understand the love the Father has lavished on you. That word lavish is intense. We're not just talking about sprinkled. We are talking about lavish, a lavish love. And I pray that all of you would grasp that love in your life today, in your pursuit of becoming healthy people. So healthy people deal with their past. Healthy people know who they are in the present. And lastly, healthy people have a vision for their future. Let's talk about vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no vision, the people perish. Vision. It's hard to have a vision in life, isn't it? I mean, life is crazy, and it's easy to just get into survival mode. I bet you guys are taking classes, you're studying, you're running from class to class, to this, to that, to friends. There's just so much going on that vision can get put on the back burner. And not only that, it doesn't get any easier. I hate to tell you, but man, with three kids now, ministry, marriage, it's like, it is so easy for the idea of vision to get put on the back burner. But I don't think when we talk about the word vision, I don't think we're talking about these elaborate goals, these like 100 point plans that we have to have. I think when we're talking about vision, we're talking about the general idea of moving in the right direction in your life, of the passion and calling that God has placed on your life. It's like a GPS. You're going to end up somewhere if you don't plug something on your GPS. It's just not going to be where you want to end up. And so the idea of vision is moving towards the right direction of God's calling on your life. And I love the idea of the triangle. I talk about this in my book, True Love Dates, but it applies to all of us, single or married. If this is God, and this is you at this part of the triangle, and this is your spouse or future spouse, the closer you move towards God, the closer they move towards God, what happens? The closer you begin moving towards one another. It's as simple as that. And sometimes we try to complicate it and we look at relationships on a vertical, in a vertical way. We, sorry, in a horizontal way. We want to just focus in on that person. How do I get to know them better? Where am I going to meet the person God has for me? I just need to know. I need to focus on relationships. I need to figure out how to make this better. But we miss the simple concept of moving in God's direction as the key component to setting ourselves up to being in the right place. I get so many singles who say to me, Deborah, what if I'm at the wrong college? What if I live in the wrong town? What if I'm taking the wrong major? What if I miss God's will for me? What if I miss the person that God has for me? And there's a lot of theories about that. Maybe I'll go into that a little later in the class I'm speaking at. But for now, I want you to know this. When you're moving towards God, you are always moving in the right direction. And that's all you need to know about vision. So what are the callings and talents and passions that God has gifted you with? And how are you taking steps in your life right now to move towards those things one day at a time? 
So some practical things before we wrap up today. If you're married again, I want to see your hands so I can remember who you are. Raise your hand if you're married. Okay. How about singles? Raise your hand. And that means dating, engaged, or so far from dating, whichever side of the spectrum you fall on. All right, if you're married in here today, I'm going to give you three practical things to move towards God. Number one, deal with your signature sins. You know when I say signature sins, I'm talking about that sin that you could sign your name on because it's so you and you struggle with it so much. What is your signature sin? Have you identified a signature sin? I think it's even scarier when people say, I don't have one, because that means they do have one, they just don't know it. And so what is your signature sin and how are you taking steps to deal with that part of your life? It could be an addiction. It could be addiction to alcohol. It could be an addiction to pornography. It could be something that the world would consider benign, like an addiction to pride or criticism. But whatever that is, how are you taking steps to deal with it? Because maybe this is the year that God wants to set you free from that signature sin. Number two, if you're married here today, don't just identify your sin, confess your sin. So much of our sin and our baggage and our issues just grow in the context of darkness. When we hide them, that's when they can really begin to have a grip on our life. And the Bible talks so much about confession. And it's something we need to practice, especially in the context of our marriages. So not only identify your signature sin, but confess your signature sin to your spouse so that you can be walking the journey of healing together. Number three, invest in your relationship with God. Like we said, when you get married, it is easy to to lose your focus on your relationship with God. I mean, scripture tells us that it's easier to focus on God when you're single, you know? So for those of us who are married, how are we taking steps to prioritize God in our life? We talk about keeping Christ at the center, but what does that practically even mean? And, and, and does our life reflect that God is the priority with our time and energy and communication? It's just like any relationship. It requires time, energy, communication. How are you investing that in your relationship with God? And, and what does God want to challenge you with this year? Maybe it's something as simple as reading more scripture Maybe it's something as simple as spending more time in prayer, getting a spiritual mentor. There's no formula of do A, B, and C. It's really all about opening your heart and, and, and really receiving from God what he wants you to do to strengthen your relationship with him and then doing it. For those of you who are single, I'm going to leave you with some practical steps here. Number one, commit to praying for your future love life. Guys, If I only knew how important marriage would be, I would have been praying since I was in elementary school. I mean, this stuff is important. The person you choose to marry, and I personally believe the Lord gives us wisdom and discretion and free choice in choosing a partner, and many of us make poor choices along the way. So pray for your future. Pray for your decision. Pray for your health and their personal health, the person you don't even know yet. Begin praying for them and just inviting God to invade that area of your life. Number two, commit to becoming the best version of yourself standing alone. We talked a lot today about all that Biola's doing in the area of counseling and marriage and relationships, and I recommend every single person in this room, even if you're a counseling major, get plugged into counseling. You don't have to be crazy to go to counseling. You don't have to be on the brink of a breakdown or a divorce to get plugged into counseling. You need to start before the problems begin and start figuring out how your past has impacted who you are today. So become the healthiest version while you can standing alone. And lastly, if you're single in here today, live your life now. You guys, I get it at a Bible, Christian, college. I mean, it's so easy to get focused on. I will live my life once I get married. You know, I've heard it all. I'm here to get my MRS degree. I'm here to get my ring by spring. All that crazy Christian college talk that we sometimes hear, you know. But the truth is, Life abundantly doesn't start when we get married. Life is happening right 
now. And if you are not living a life of purpose in your singleness, you will not be living a life of purpose in your marriage either. You know, so do what God has called you to do and enjoy your life abundantly while single. Now, let me just do a side note here. That doesn't mean you're not going to struggle with singleness. That doesn't mean that you're not going to desire marriage. That doesn't mean you're not a good Christian if you desire marriage or that Jesus isn't good enough for you if you desire marriage. It just means that you are created by a God who made you for relationships. So rejoice in that desire and then enjoy your life while you wait for the next step. I think it's so important to learn to live life with purpose, whether we're single or married or somewhere in between. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.